next on The Professional Rule Breaker. I'm Andy Tolbert. If you've ever felt in business like you are swimming upstream and everybody else has taken the easy way and you're just not sure why, maybe hop on over and listen to The Professional Rule Breaker. You might realize you're not alone. So welcome back to the Professional Rule Breaker Podcast. I am your host, Kathy Walter House. And today I have someone who's been a friend of mine for the last 20 years. And I think you're gonna really enjoy her. So Andy Tolbert has been an entrepreneur since selling cinnamon infused toothpicks in the fifth grade. So think about that. What were you doing when you were in the fifth grade? And now she focuses on real estate for her money endeavors. And for over the last 20 years, she's been active in the real estate and mortgage fields as a broker, instructor, and investor. She also has a business that provides safety and self-defense training to realtors and to women. And she has set a goal that she wants to retire herself and her husband, Tim, in the next two years. And I think maybe that's a goal that we all should have. <laughs> and that's all through her passive income. So when she's not doing real estate, you can find her in her Jeep, volunteering and spending time with her two dogs. So I want to welcome my friend, Andy Tolbert. Hello. <laughs> hello, hello. Hello there. I am so happy to have you. So I have to tell you, this was news to me that you started in the fifth grade as an entrepreneur. Because I was thinking that's probably like you're probably 11 years old at that time or so, because that's the same time I started. And I didn't even know I was an entrepreneur back then, but that's when I started. So you were selling cinnamon infused toothpicks. So are these ones that you made yourself or what did you do? <laughs> yeah, you buy the, the cinnamon essential oil and then you just put the toothpicks in it, let it soak for a couple days. And then I would wrap them up in little tin foil packets like can you imagine today me selling <laughs> tin foil packets in a public school <laughs> yeah <laughs> probably no <laughs> it was something else the funniest thing is years like 20 years later maybe even longer my mom is on a cruise with a whole bunch of people and this lady is talking to her at dinner and she goes do you have a daughter named Andy and she goes yeah why Your son used to buy toothpicks from her oh no way no yep. way wow wow so obviously well first I, guess I, I had think some, about it. some branding that's I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but think about it you know 20 years ago I'm trying to think when the flavored toothpicks kind of came into play maybe they stole your idea you never I'm know. Old. That was that was like late seventies, early eighties. I'm I'm a little older than I look. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you look great. You look absolutely great. But isn't that <laughs> funny? Yeah. But I bet you in doing that, like the first time you made a sale, it probably impacted you, right? And it well, made I always I worked in the family business growing up, so I was always whatever everything from sweeping to we we owned a gun store so okay. literally at eight years old i was in the back of the gun department melting wow. lead and reloading ammo wow <laughs> yeah <laughs> so needless to say you probably know your way around guns if you started way back when a little bit yeah little yeah bit. yeah so is that what kind of got you into one of the many things that you do, the safer agent. It kind of came around, honestly, as an investor. And, you know, I've been buying and fixing up and flipping and renting houses for I, my canned answer now is just 20 plus years. I was going in and out of investment level properties. And a lot of times my so a real estate agent, a lot of times you have a client with you. But as an investor, I was going to these houses to preview them myself 
bored myself. And I was going into some sketchy situations. Um, in one house, once a vac totally vacant house, we found a gun. We've found um, all kinds of drug paraphernalia when we go into houses. But one that really stands out is an investor had foreclosed on a, on a mortgage that they held and they were trying to sell the property. So Tim and I went over to take a look at it one day. Area we're not familiar with, that's the first lesson. It was an area <laughs> we're not familiar with. It was about an hour away. Okay. And as we drove up, we were, this was before the day and age of your phone telling you where to turn in a hundred yards. Okay. So we were so focused on trying to find the property that we weren't paying attention to our surroundings maybe as much as we should have been. And we pulled up to the house and the code they gave us for the lockbox didn't work. Okay. So we've driven an hour. Code doesn't work. We're, we're mad. So we say, well, we're here. Let's go ahead and at least walk around the outside of the house and see if we can peek in the windows. Because you can get a pretty good idea just from peeking. So Tim went to the left, I went to the right, and the house was one that's up on piers. So the window was kind of like right here at chin height. So I'm peeking in the window, trying to see what I can see. And all of a sudden a face pops up in the other side of the window right in front of me. And oh I screamed and Tim came running around the, from the other side. It ends <laughs> up, it was a squatter that was in the house. Um, he was nice. He was friendly. Actually, he was telling us all about the neighborhood. Oh, but wow. once we stopped and started looking around, we're looking around and like half the houses in the neighborhood are boarded up. And okay. it was like, we came in with such blinders on, we weren't paying attention. Mm. So that was kind of what started the whole, yeah, if we're going to be out here doing this, we, we've got to take some steps to be uh, smarter about it. So lessons, we should have looked at the neighborhood when we came in. We should not have split up. We should have stayed together. Nowadays, I'll tell you, one of my biggest tools that I use every day is what I call the Google walk around. Okay. I pull up an address and I literally will like walk around the neighborhood. I'll look at all the other streets. I'll turn around. You don't even need to leave the house anymore. You can do it all sitting at your laptop or on your phone. There's been a few times I haven't done the Google walk around and I get there and I'm like, Mm, yep. If I had done the Google walk around, I could have saved us this trip. Yeah. So really you think about it. It's all about awareness. I mean, that's bottom line, what it boils down to. And it doesn't matter if it's real estate or, you know, you could be working for um, a corporation, you could be traveling, you could be doing just about anything. And I know in this day and age, don't you think like we're on our phones or we have headphones on, you know, and same thing. We almost have blinders, right? In which yep. we're walking around, we're not paying attention to the circumstances. And that's when things can happen. So. In the self-defense world, we, we call that the levels of awareness. So there's actually four levels. There's unaware, aware, alert, and alarm. And at each of those stages, you're moving the level of your alertness and how we decide where we need to be on that schedule is three things, real simple, where you are, who you're with and what you're doing. Hey there, you know, I'm all about making a big difference, making this really big impact. So I am so thrilled to introduce to you today's podcast sponsor. They are the very last U.S family owned manufacturer of consumer goods products, products that you use every single day and you run out of them every single day. And on top of that, the products are healthier and safer for you. And they have been made here in the great USA. My family made the switch and I am so happy that we did. And so is everyone else in the family because the products are amazing. So while these big giant corporations are just getting bigger and so many small businesses are really struggling to survive, why not help me in rooting for the underdog? And you know, I'm all about the underdog instead of these giant 11 conglomerates that control 97% of the North American consumer goods market. 
So if you're ready to make a difference and switch away to something bigger and better, go to switchaway.com forward slash rule breaker, drop your information and one of my friends will reach out to you directly. And let's all switch away together to better quality products that are healthier and safer for you and support family owned businesses because together we can rewrite the business landscape and make a difference one person at a time. So if I'm at home with my husband watching TV and all the doors are locked, I can be at that lower end of the scale. Mm -hmm. But when I'm, for example, when I'm traveling to go speak and I'm in an unfamiliar area and I'm staying at a hotel that I've never been at before, obviously I'm a little higher. And then like one of my trips where I notice a guy in the parking lot watching which room I'm going to, I was way higher that night. It, it wasn't a good night's sleep for me, but because of who I was with, which was nobody, I was by myself, what I was doing, I was at an unfamiliar hotel and where I was, an unfamiliar city. And then this guy adds that layer of watching me. I had to be at that higher level. So real simple, where you are, who you're with and what you're doing determines where on that awareness scale you need to be. And that is everything. This is not just for real estate. Like you said, traveling is a huge one, especially if you're traveling overseas, maybe even to a, a country where it's known for higher crime rates, for um, tourist attacks, for pickpocketing, all of those things. Yeah. Um, a, a friend of mine said it the other day, don't go to stupid places with stupid people and do stupid things. <laughs> that is the, that's a great say. <laughs> it kind but of sums say, it up. But let's say you're not with stupid people, not doing stupid things. You still have to be aware. I think about I mean I obviously I've traveled a lot for what I do for a living and I think about the experiences that I've had and I think I'm pretty like ultra aware but things even at that point can happen. Like there was one time very early in my career, I was actually at a sales seminar in Washington, DC, a really, really big sales seminar. And I was at one of the bigger hotels. I don't wanna name the hotel, but like a, one of the bigger hotels, nice, nice hotel in the Georgetown area. I go to the bathroom. So you think there's, thousands of people around you at any given moment, people going in and out all the time. I go into the bathroom. I hear somebody come in. I didn't pay attention. I just assumed it was another female that was coming into the bathroom. A couple seconds later, I hear a woman, like the door whips open and I hear a woman go, are you all right? Oh my gosh, are you all right? And then I hear a flurry of activity. And then I'm like, what's going on? So I actually didn't say anything. And she kept on like screaming, Oh my gosh, are you all right? Are you all right? And what had happened was a man had actually followed me into the bathroom and I didn't realize it and was waiting for me to get out of the stall. And if she had not seen it by the grace of God, you know, and had run in there, something really bad could happen. Well, wouldn't you know, I had another similar situation probably about four or five months ago, the exact same thing happened. So when something like that happens, Andy, you, you know, that teach self-defense, what do you recommend about things like that? Well, one of the things we have now that's a luxury is right here. It's pretty much in your hand all the time. So even sitting in the stall with your pants down, you could still pick up the phone and call somebody. You could call the hotel security, you could call 911, or you could even just pretend. And that's probably gonna be enough to scare that, that bad guy away. And I say bad guy, but I want you to realize it could also be bad girls. It's not, it could be- Yeah, it could teams. be anybody. It could yeah, be anybody. they even use kids to get you to drop your guard. So just, um, we recently were going to Disney Springs and, there was a guy with like this big baby buggy with two babies in it. And they basically just like waved him right through security. And I'm like, mm. 
Mm-hmm. All you need is a baby and you can hide whatever you want under their butt and get them in. So absolutely. Yeah. So that's, that's never, never a good thing. Yeah. I'm glad you pointed out the whole thing about the cell phone because <laughs> I had been the, the last episode I've been with my husband. I knew the bathroom was just literally inside the door. We had been eating outside. It was just inside the door, just right around the corner. So I left my cell phone on the table. So I'm in there. I'm in the bathroom. I know what's going on because I could see the feet. Uh-huh. And I was scared to death. I had completely forgotten that I had an Apple watch on, but I could have probably done the exact same thing, you know? And I just waited. I was like, I'm going to stay in here as long as it takes, you know, for you to go away. Eventually someone will come looking for you. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I think the person kind of got tired waiting and and then i heard the door open but then i thought did they just open the door are they still there and i was like i can't be here forever so i opened the door whipped the door open and was like (laughs) you know front facing because i'm like if something's going to happen i'm going to see you you know before it happens and luckily they had gone out um, for me but but i think that that's a really good lesson in no matter how prepared you might think you might be it's always good to really have that awareness. But I want to say, because it's interesting, because one of the, the notes that I kind of want to make is that you have this experience, right? You're a real estate investor. You go out there. You had this scary experience. And then now you have created a business from it. And that's kind of the message that I want to tell people out there. You have experiences that only you have that you can create this amazing business exactly like what you've done you've created this amazing business of the safer agent but it doesn't just apply to real estate obviously that's yes and look at that for all the people that (laughs) are listening not watching she has a book and it's called this is it the safer agent or is it safer safer agent i think amazon might have it as the okay okay and we'll be sure we'll have that in the show notes Um, for everybody to be able to find. But I also want to talk about reinvention because we all know what happened in like, and I know this very well (laughs) as well, uh, uh, because this is one, the way that I met Andy was through real estate investing. So 2006, when things blow up in the real estate market, (laughs) let's talk about reinvention. So what happened at that point for you? They were the best of times. They were the worst of times. (laughs) (laughs) Should add some music to that. All in one year, it seems they were the best of times and the worst of times all in like one year. Absolutely. Absolutely. A lot of people were doing risky things. Mm -hmm. And a lot of fingers have been pointed at the wrong problem during all that. I'll tell you right now, mortgage brokers got thrown under the bus and all of that. And the truth is mortgage brokers had zero decision-making ability. All they did was submitted a file to the bank or the lender. And the bank or the lender is who made the programs up and approved the programs. But they have more money in their lobbying. So they didn't come out with mud on their face. The mortgage brokers kind of took the whole fall on that. But what I was seeing is all of a sudden... The cashier at Walmart was getting 95% financing stated income on investments. And it's like, yeah, this we're building this house of cards yeah, and something's about to tumble. So we knew that was coming. What's different right now is the lending is way stricter. They're not doing those crazy things. You, you can still get like alternate documentation loans, but you're probably putting down 25 or 30% down. So there's a whole different layer of protection there where those same, that foreclosure explosion we had isn't going to happen again. It would, well, I guess I should never say it won't because it can, it would take a lot. It would have Mm -hmm. to be completely different than last time. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So then once that all happened, how do you build yourself back up? Because I think everyone in life, 
and obviously in business, we've all had in some shape or form a failure, some bigger than others. So how do you pick yourself up by the bootstraps and continue doing what it is that you know, but maybe make it better? It, it took a while, I'll be honest. It was probably three or four years after all of that before we bought our next property. We bought one. And then honestly, it was probably another three years before we bought number two. And it really kind of, once we did, the first one was kind of like, okay, let's put our toe in the water and see what happens. And then a couple years later, we said, okay, here's, here's a good deal. Let's buy this one. And then all of a sudden it was like, what the heck have we been waiting for? And we just started stacking them on <laughs> after that. And, but it's, it's hard when you're, you're gun shy from past experiences. I'm now talking to people in their like late twenties, thirties, even forties that are interested in, in getting into real estate investing, but they remember seeing their parents lose everything. But what we're doing now is we analyze everything different. We used to look at if it at least covered its own bills and broke mm -hmm. even, we saw it as our retirement. Even if I have to throw 100 or 200 at it every month, mm -hmm. that's the same as putting 200 into an IRA. But what we do differently now is if it can't support itself, and when I say support itself, I also mean uh, emergency unexpected stuff. Right. Like we, we used to say all our property that makes $200 a month, that's $2,400 a year. Now I look at it and say, if I need a new septic system, that's four years worth of my, my income. If I need an air conditioner, that's two years. If I And I literally just spell this all out. And I'm like, no, that's not enough. So, so we've how, passed how on a lot of, of a cushion. I was going to say, because there you would have to have a big cushion. Because if it's a rental, like let's say it's a property that you want to rent, you could have renters not pay their rent, destroy the property after they leave. There's so much. So is there a percentage over? Like, hey, I need to at least be making 25% over or, or I need to have this type of nest egg built yeah. up in this particular property. There's a couple. We personally look for at least about a $400 okay. spread. Because okay. that's basically call it five grand a year. So even if something okay. major comes up, like we just had to replumb half the house last week. I haven't gotten the bill yet, but I'm expecting somewhere around 2000. Mm -hmm. But that property makes me about 800 a month. So that's only going to be two or three months worth of income. And then I'm back on track. Right. Now, the challenge is it's hard to buy something today that's going to make you 800. You know, that's right. a property we bought probably six or seven years ago. So, you know, we bought it cheap and then the rents have gone up. But here's the whole thing. In fact, it's a cliche saying, don't wait to buy real estate, buy real estate and wait. Mm -hmm. When we bought that house, we didn't think we were making any great deal. We just said, oh, it'll make us a couple hundred dollars a month. We paid, I want to say for that one, 109000 and right now I could probably sell it for about 350 yep. in what, six years. So imagine if somebody had bought 10 of those properties six years ago, they'd now be sitting on more than $200,000. Even after expenses of sale, you'd clear about 200,000 each, take off some taxes and you're at what one? You're making a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, so 170,000 times 10 properties, you literally in six years can sell them all and put $1.7 million in the bank after taxes and everything. So that's another lesson, patience, absolutely patience. patience. And I learned that, we, uh, my husband and I learned that because we did own some rental properties and we sold them. Before. Look back at all of those. Look, what would they yes. be if you had them right now? Oh my What goodness. would they be renting for? A lot what more than what I was talking? renting it for, probably double of what I was renting it for. In addition to that, I probably, because I know what we purchased the properties for, so we easily could have made triple, actually a lot more than triple. It would easily it would have been way over a million dollars um, that we could have probably put in the bank. But that is a lesson in, like I said, patience. 
So, and I would say that's one of the areas that I need to work on is patience. I, I like to move fast. Don't we all though? We all like to move fast. So, but again, that's something that you'll learn. I always think of anything that you do in life and anything that happens, whether it's good or bad, something good comes out of it. And even if it's something bad, sometimes you have to look really, really hard. So if you had this massive failure, you're learning something from that failure or something go really wrong in your business, you're going to learn something from it. So that's something good that comes out of it. Well, and all of your followers can take that back to their business. Mm -hmm. If you're like, for example, now I teach people how to be real estate investors. And if I said, well, I've only ever invested when times are good, let me show you how to do it. And right now, there's a lot of people worried about where our economy is going over the next few years. And is it going to be as rosy as it's been? I can literally say, you know what? I've been there. We lost everything. Let me tell you what's different. And why what we're doing is different, why the market is different, because somebody who's been through the hard times and survived is going to have a better chance of surviving the next one. Absolutely. And that is all about the story. That's a sales story, actually, that you are creating. And that's, it's funny because I touched, I recorded something yesterday and I touched on the sales story because nobody likes perfection. And exactly like what you said about if you were to teach and, and have only been in the market and everything's been wonderful and it's been rosy and you can say, this is really great. And that but if it, people will still buy from you, but if you can go and you can say, hey, I went bankrupt or I lost money or I went through the 2006 episode of where the real estate market crashed and now I, I know what to do so to mitigate something like that was ever to happen again. People are going to be like, oh gosh, she really knows because she lived through it through the really bad times. So even when times are good, it's gonna be even better, but when times are bad, it's still gonna be good. And people really gravitate towards that because they see, oh yeah, I was in that situation because I lived through that 2006 as well too. I remember there was a couple properties that we had wanted to sell. It was our original intention just to renovate the properties and sell it. And we ended up having to hold on to them for quite some time. And we did okay, but it wasn't what my plan was. So yeah, I can certainly appreciate what it is that you're teaching, especially now. Well, and to all, every business, no matter what business you're in, if you're watching or listening to this, have somebody that you can bounce ideas off of maybe in your industry, maybe not in your industry, but have somebody who's kind of at your level. So if you're an owner of a company, have friends that are owners of companies that you can bounce ideas off of. Um, I remember one property once that we did, and it was the everything that could go wrong did go wrong. As we're in the rehab, and it, I, it was on Hartwell, but if you know how Sanford is, remember it's got Hartwell might have eight different places that aren't connected together because they're broken up throughout the city. So on the six o'clock news, they broke up a chicken fighting ring on Hartwell. Oh, they gosh. had a stabbing and rape on Hartwell. Oh, Nowhere yeah. near our Hartwell. It was like miles and miles <laughs> away. But it all still the has the name Hartwell. <laughs> said Hartwell. So we finally, towards the end, we ended up taking an offer from somebody. We lost, I think about $3,500 when the dust settled. We, had, we lost money on the deal, but we were out of it. We were happy. We were don't wanters. We were so emotionally unattached to that property. We were haters. We did not, I, I don't <laughs> care, just get rid of this property. And we sold it. We lost money. And like a week later, Tim and I looked at each other. We're like, Why'd we do that? We could kind of turn it in and we would have made about $600 a month as a rental. So it, and we, if you're not gonna believe us, we sold it for like 60,000 and that street is selling for like 275 now, yeah. but we could have made money as a rental, but we were so focused on, I hate this property, get rid of it. It's it such a problem. Vision. Yeah, it was tunnel that vision. We didn't, all we had to do was throw a tenant in it 
and we would have been fine. In fact, we would have made some good profit. So mm -hmm. have somebody, it, that's what we do for people now is we look at stuff, we're like, mm, you need to sell that, that's a dog, or why don't you do this, why don't you do that? If somebody had just looked, if we had asked for help, somebody would have said, why don't you just throw a tenant at it? And we would have gone, oh. mm -hmm. but sometimes you're so knee deep in your problems that you can't see that there's other options. Yeah. So get a, get a good support team. Absolutely. A mentor is always great because they can bounce ideas off of, you know, you can bounce ideas off of them, but not only that, they will help you get to where you want to go faster as well. And then if you're having a problem with tunnel vision, because exactly what you say, sometimes when you are so engrossed in whatever problem you're having, it's like you just focus, 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 focus on that problem. And you're forgetting about everything else that's outside of it. And if you just take a moment, right? And in your case, that's what you did. You took a moment, a little longer moment, but you took a moment and you sat back. Then you see the big picture. Because I think a lot of times the big picture will give you more information about how to solve that little, you know, it may not look like a little problem, but it is if you're focusing solely on that. And when you have somebody that's a mentor, it's somebody looking from the outside in. And, and that's actually one of the things I do, because sometimes there's like low hanging fruit that when I'm talking to people, I'm like, okay, look right here. This is, this is like right here. You need a sale. There's one right here for you. This is where you need to go that you kind of just ignore um, if you're just focusing on that problem. So, so let me ask you this, Andy, what makes you a rule breaker? <laughs> oh, you know, I have never been one that does well with being told what to do. The, <laughs> I, I did not do super well in corporate America because there's that whole hierarchy. And just because you're higher does not mean you are smarter or a better worker. It just means either you shook the right hands or you've just been there longer. So I had a huge problem with that. Out of college, I ended up working for a large retail company. We won't talk, we won't talk names, <laughs> but I saw people. I was working circles around them, but they were getting paid more. At one point I got, it was me and one other girl who were up for the next management training program. And it was a large store. It wasn't like a little mall store. It was one of the large box stores. She and I were both up for the management training program. We went through everything. And at the end, they said, we think she just has a little more experience and we're going to put her in this slot. But the next slot that opens up is yours. And then I watched what they did to her over the next few months and how many hours they made her work and all the overnight she had to work and all this. And I, I was like, mm, yeah, no, I don't want that next slot, but thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. So, but no, wait, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank, thanks. But no, thanks. I respect authority when they're deserving of the authority, if that makes sense. Absolutely. I do not respect it if they're given it just because of a job position or a title or maybe they know someone else. or something yeah. like that. Yes. Mm -hmm. So in also in fifth grade, I was busy back then in fifth grade, wasn't I? I played the flute and the snare drum in our band. And then one day our band director came in and he decided that he was going to change us to a marching band. And he takes us outside in the parking lot and practices marching and all this stuff. And I started a petition <laughs> Or where we didn't want them to be a marching band and everybody signed the petition and we weren't a marching band anymore. But that's, again, you're our leader. You're just deciding what we're going to do without ever asking if that's what we even wanted to do. So I didn't understand the leadership concept back then. I just knew it was hot outside and I didn't want to be marching in a parking lot carrying my instrument. So let's pass around a petition. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you started being a rule breaker, I think, very early on. And yeah. uh probably not what some of those teachers called me, but that's okay. <laughs> no, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. I think you were being assertive, I would say. And definitely being a bit of a rule breaker, but 
I always tell people rule breaker is not about breaking laws. It's about thinking outside the box. And in your case, you didn't want to go march. So you thought outside the box and you're like, hey, I'm going to do a petition. (laughs) (laughs) And that is what you did. So really interesting there. So where can people but, find but where you? Can, where can you carry that into your life today? Right. If you see something being done that you don't agree with, you do not have to sit back and take it. Right. You, if you're in a corporate world, you can go to the powers that be above you and say, hey, here's what's going on. Here's why I think it's not going to work. Or guess what? You can go find another job. You do not have to stay in a position that makes you unhappy and they have you doing things that you don't want to do. I mean, the next step is I could have just quit the band and said, I'm not going to play anymore. Right. Right. So we, we have choices. I see so many people that are miserable where they are and all they do is complain and they hate it and they hate this, they hate that. And I'm like, so do something about it. Absolutely. No, I understand exactly what you're saying. It's in many cases, it's almost like they feel it's like the golden handcuffs. They're making money somewhere and they are miserable. And I can tell you, I have been in that exact same situation where I had a position in which I actually really liked what I was doing. I just, they put in a, cause I didn't want to move up to the next level because I loved what I was doing so much. So then they put somebody in that was just, I don't think I could say, excuse my language, a shit show in place. And so it got to the point where I was so miserable because I just saw how the company was heading in a direction that wasn't the direction, I guess it wasn't an honest and a good place to be. And that's one of my golden rules. I will never do something that will hurt someone or that I don't think is right. So it doesn't matter how much you're making. If you, in essence, sell your soul and you're doing something that you are absolutely miserable, there's other jobs out there. Go find another job. Go start a side hustle. Go do something different so that you have that satisfaction, right, Andy? And because there's so much opportunity. I mean, we're so lucky for the folks that live here in the States. We are so lucky that it doesn't matter where you come from, you can achieve anything that you want to. So. And. Our entire outlook on the side hustle has completely changed. I remember 20 years ago being at networking meetings where somebody said, you know, oh, I have this job, but I also do this on the side. And people would whisper like, they can't focus on one thing. They have to have two things. And it it used to be like a stigma. If you did more than one thing, it was like, it was bad. So people wouldn't work with you in either field because obviously you're not very good because you have to do two things. Nowadays, it's the opposite. People glorify the side hustle. In fact, you can say, hey, I got four different side hustles. And people like, oh, you do? Tell me more. I want to learn. So the, the environment for that side hustle has completely changed. Absolutely. I can't agree with you more. There's actually an episode with a guest by the name of Christian Henneke, and it is all about the side hustle and how he's been able to take his side hustle to make millions. So I will put that in the show notes too to refer back to that if for anybody that's interested in a side hustle that really works, you can certainly go ahead and look at it there. But you're so right. I think there's nothing wrong with doing more than one thing because you have to feed your soul. When you feed your soul and you are just happy and satisfied, it's great if you do one thing and you love what you do and you're excited every single day about it, that's fantastic. But there's a little piece of you over here that's missing something, right? Why not explore other avenues. What do you have to lose, right? The worst thing that can happen is you fail in that. So what? Then you learn, right? Well, the other thing, and one of the 
reasons that I teach people how to build the passive income through real estate is your primary hustle, your primary job, even if you're the business owner, that does not mean it's going to last forever. Mm -hmm. What if your business announces tomorrow it's been bought out and now your job is eliminated? What if you get in a car accident on the way home and you get hurt and you can't work for six months? All these different things, if you don't have some other type of passive income and investments and planning for the future, it could be all over in a book. And then all of a sudden you're struggling and you don't know how you're paying. How am I buying groceries this week? Yeah. You know, last, last week you were high on the hog and you had a great job or a great business. This week, something has changed and you don't have that anymore. So Absolutely. that's why I'm, I'm always looking at planning for, I, I understand the real estate industry may not always be as strong as it is right now because I've been there. Yeah. And it's, it's you great. Know Everybody always needs my rental properties. They do. They do. And there's that passive stream of income that you can always count on when we could go down a, a foxhole on this one. But T, if you know who T. Harv Ecker is, it's all about the multiple streams of income. It's having multiple different types of maybe passive income coming in. It could be investment. It could be, you know, real estate, which is also like investment properties. It could be from other areas as well, too. But like I said, we would go down a major foxhole and maybe you and I can have a second episode and just talk about that in, it, in itself, Andy. So I want to ask, where could people find you? easy to find. I'm, I'm all over Facebook. That's kind of my primary where I'm, I am the most of the time. My personal profile is Andy Werger Tolbert. We, Tim and I run an investment group that's free to join and we share all types of tips and training in there. Uh, I, I might be rebranding it right now. It's just called Andy and Tim's investing. I, I might play I with it. I like that. <laughs> you know, it says what it is, but it, it's, it's not that sexy for branding. I don't know. And then if you are a, a realtor, we have a page called Safer Agent. And then if you are interested in the, the shooting and firearms, our lady shooting group is called Heels and Holsters, but we do events for guys too. Wow. Okay. In fact, so, my next event is going to be a couples training event because you need, oh, wow. to, you need to know how to work together in a self-defense situation. Yes. Absolutely. I think that's a really great topic as well, too. Wow. That's fantastic. So Andy, I want to thank you for being a guest at the Professional Rule Breaker. It's been fun having you here and just learning a little bit more about you that I didn't know. I mean, that whole cinnamon infused toothpick story on how you started is pretty amazing. And it kind of led you to real estate investing and businesses that you have right now. And it's so weird because I started at 11 as well, and it was in real estate. So imagine that. I always think that everything happens for a reason. Maybe that's why our paths cross because we were both at 11 years old out there trying to make a buck in some shape or form. <laughs> but I really want to thank you for being a, a guest. And all of Andy's links will be in the show notes. So I really highly encourage you to check it out and follow her if you want to invest in real estate or some of the other things that she does. And if you're looking for self-defense, I can tell you she is the lady to go to. And for everybody that's been listening, I just want you to think about how Andy has been able to really start a business due to her experience. And that's something that you can do too, because only you have the skills and the knowledge and the experience that is so special to you. And you know that I'm all about making a difference in the world. So take your experiences and throw it out there. It's like throwing a stone into a stream and causing that ripple effect because you never know who you can affect in a positive way. So again, everyone, thank you so much for joining us at the Professional Rule Breaker Show. And until next time, keep on breaking some rules.